Now it's official. So everyone, I want to welcome you to the final guest lecture here at the Belfast Summer School for 2021. I am very excited to introduce this afternoon's speaker. I've had the pleasure of knowing Georgina Homer as a student of ancient Greek, and I'm delighted to see her working so hard on completing her PhD at Coventry University. She's working under the supervision of Judith Mosman and Daniel Anderson. Okay, so heavyweights in their field for sure. Georgina graduated with her BA in 2017 and her MA in 2019 in classical studies from the Open University. She was subsequently awarded a studentship to embark upon her doctoral project. Her research is primarily focused on the cinematic and the televisual reception of minor characters in Greek tragedy. Today, Georgina will present her paper on the afterlives of Euripides' unstaged princess. We're honored to have her. I'm especially delighted to have her. So without further delay, I'll hand over now to Georgina and give her a big welcome to Belfast Summer School this year. Brilliant. Hi, everyone. Um, yep, so I'm just going to I'll get straight into it, I think. Um, so my research looks at on-screen receptions of minor characters from Greek tragedy. I have a twofold approach. Firstly, investigating the minor characters within the context of the plays before moving on to their receptions and illusions within on-screen media. My ultimate plan is to look at some characters individually, whilst grouping and investigating others as categories such as messengers and nurses. One character who I have researched in some depth is the princess in Euripides Medea, whom only appearing in the famous and gruesome messenger speech has no action, no speech, nor a name in the fifth century text. And yet she has a curious afterlife and has been amplified as a character for almost two and a half thousand years. <coughs> uh, in Euripides Medea, the princess is a victim of Medea's revenge because she married Jason, leaving Medea husbandless and facing exile. Consequently, she dies a most dire death at the hands of Medea, as narrated in the messenger speech. However, it could be argued that she is not a character at all. Can we call a figure only spoken about with no physical presence a character at all, for instance? This has led to some scholars suggesting that she is indistinct, simply an, an anonymous figure hovering on the fringes of the action. A counter to this stance may ask whether there is such a thing as being simply anonymous in Greek tragedy. It is an investigation beyond the scopes of this paper for now. However, it is not unreasonable to presume that every character or figure within the extant tragedies are there for very good reasons. In the case of the Euripidean princess, I believe her anonymity is anything but simple and maybe an essential part of her characterization as a respectable woman. The not naming of women was, after all, a common convention in Athenian society, from Thucydides' famous funeral speech of Pericles to oratory and other examples within tragedy. Thus, this, this is not an isolated example. Conversely, David Shapps tells us that disreputable women are more often named. What is fascinating about this figure, who does not seem to have been known at all before Euripides' time, does acquire a name in later scholia and summaries. This name is Glauchy, a name which has remained almost consistently ever since. However, she, is also, she also has a Latin name, Crusa, used by Roman writers such as Ovid and Seneca. The name is a generic feminized version of Creon, which means king. Therefore, they are essentially naming her princess. Interestingly, Higginus actually refers to her as both Crusa and Glauchy. Where the name Glauchy originated, although attested as her name in scholar and hypotheses, has not been looked into in great much detail. Well, not until my thesis anyway. <laughs> However, after a significant amount of research, it is possible the early mid fourth century playwright Carcinus the Younger was the first to assign the name. This name itself does have origins before Euripides from the adjective glaucos, meaning clear, bright or gleaming and suggesting a freshness of youth. It was most often assigned to young daughters, brides and nymphs as early as Hesiod. This name is important because it, used, it is used many times after Euripides in versions of the Medea myth, including in two of the three on-screen versions that I will talk about shortly. The fact that the princess already sees a transformation by being given a name serves to show that there is something to be gained in studying her further revolutions and afterlives. Although there are some excellent examples of the princess's reception in ancient reception, 
I'm going to move directly to her portrayal in films and TV. In 1969, Pier Paolo Pasolini produced his version of Medea, which encompassed his own views on bourgeoisie capitalism and a clash between two cultures with opposed views of reality, those being primitivism and rationalism. The film represents a Medea who comes from a primitive and sacred land, whilst Jason embodies the bourgeoisie with no care of the sacred and a move towards the modern. The film is inherently occupied by oppositions and doubling, and it also asks the fundamental questions of whether Medea had done anything wrong. It is in this vein that we find an interesting character in the Princess Glauchy, who, amongst other things, is subjected to two deaths. The first of her death scenes is essentially a dreamlike sequence, as Medea imagines and foretells Glauchy's death. In the scene, the princess accepts the deadly gifts from Jason and the children, as we see in Euripides, and instructs her handmaidens, handmaidens to prepare me. They dress her in the robe and headpiece, and comparable to Euripides, she gazes at herself in the mirror, smiling at her lifeless image. Many of her preceding actions also mirror the fifth century play, including how she frantically runs out of the town walls, the golden crown sending out an unbelievable flow of all devour, devouring flower, fire. <laughs> Burning, she falls to the ground, overcome by misfortune, and her father falls upon the corpse and burns alongside his daughter. The imagery here heavily draws on Euripides, whereas in the second death, there is a significant divergence from the Euripidean plot. Preceding her actual death, the princess is seen sat in her quarters, staring wide-eyed, looking anguished. Her father enters the room and a serving woman quickly wipes away tears from the girl's eyes. What a beautiful bridal gown, he says to her, but she does not respond continuing her wide-eyed glare, and he quickly leaves. In the next scene, we see a very similar thing to what we see in Euripides, when the king visits Medea to tell her that her and her children must go into exile, before actually allowing Medea an extra day to stay in Corinth. However, his reason for doing so is given more weight in Pasolini. He says, I am not banishing you out of hate or out of suspicion because you're so different, a barbarian, come here with the markings of another race on you, but rather out of the love for my daughter who feels remorse towards you. She knows that you are suffering and she suffers too. This marriage with Jason, my dear, has become the source of anything but happiness. As I mentioned above, the film questions Medea's culpability and it is significant then that Pasolini has the Creon character differ so greatly from the Euripides king who doesn't trust her. He is more concerned with the unhappiness that Glauchy's sympathising is causing her da his daughter. And it would seem that he is right to feel this way because in her actual death scene, Glauchy appears to commit suicide. Compared to the imaginary death, the scene is much faster paced. There is no footage of her being dressed. Instead, it cuts away to Creon looking sullen before cutting back to a dressed, teary Glauchy, gazing at herself in the mirror. The scene then quickly cuts away to her running into the palace grounds, swiftly followed by her father. The pair briefly exchange looks and his expression is fraught with concern and realisation. The princess runs again, her father following her and flees up to the top of the palace walls before leaping to her death. Her father reaches the same point, briefly looking down upon her body before jumping himself. Both die in the same way, just as in Euripides, However, Pasolini seems to give them a choice in their death. They are not simply dying from the poison, from the, the effects of Medea's magic. Instead, in a sense, their deaths mark escapisms. Glauchy, unhappy with the situation she finds herself in, needs to escape the marriage or the pity she is feeling for Medea's plight. Whereas the Creon character escaping, is escaping life without his daughter or with the guilt of knowing that he was party to the events that ultimately killed her. Interestingly, some may regard this death as occurring because the gifts from Medea are actually attacking Glauchy's mind, driving her mad enough to jump. This argument, I believe, fails to factor in the subsequent death of her father in meeting the same fate as his daughter, a trope of Euripides and subsequent adaptations. Arguably, she may have been affected by the curse and then her father committed suicide out of grief or guilt. But I personally think that this is an unnecessary ambiguity that does not have a place in the narrative. 
Pasolini already kills them both in the same manner in the dream sequence. It would therefore stand to reason that he would replicate this in the second death. For these reasons, and the clear unhappiness of Glauchi and her father's own words to Medea, it is clear that the princess commits suicide. The ramifications of this are interesting as it abolishes some of the guilt on Medea's part, but it also establishes a once minor unstaged character as a figure with presence and agency who not only develops the plot, but redefines it. Just get a sip of water. <clears throat> Almost 20 years later, in 1988, the Danish filmmaker Lars von Trier made his version of the Medea for Danish TV. As a TV film, it straddles between the two forms of on-screen production styles. It is no secret that he based his production on the unrealized screenplay of his late fellow Dane filmmaker, Carl Theodor Dreyer. I mean, it, and it was the only time that Von Trier had ever worked with a script that wasn't his own, the only film he ever made that was adapted from a literary source, and to date, the only film with a, an historical narrative. Within the film, the role of Glauke is somewhat limited, However, she is a fully fledged character who holds genuine agency in the narrative, most prominently during the wedding night scenes with Jason. One very noticeable thing about Von Trier's Glauke is just how young she is. To me, she looks like a child. After lots of research, I've not been able to find out how old the, the actress was when she played her. She seems to have gone off the radar completely after appearing in this film. Um, but to me, she looks very young indeed, particularly in comparison to the actor Udo Kier, who plays Jason, who would have been about 44 at the time. After the wedding ceremony, the newlyweds are carried off to a small island. Upon it stands a makeshift tent with a bed. There is a powerful tension as Jason lays his young bride down, looming over her. He gently strokes her face before more forcibly placing his fingers inside her mouth. As a child like Glauke lays there with her eyes closed, the audience are waiting for the scenes we are all too familiar with, where new husband controls the consummation of marriage, the clear age difference making this scene all the more distressing. However, Glauke stops him. She grabs him by the wrist and removes his fingers from her mouth before standing up and withdrawing behind some curtains. Then a fascinating conversation ensues which actually derives almost directly from the script of Carl Dreyer and essentially cements this Glauke, not as the passive princess we hear about in Euripides, but as a woman who is taking control of the one thing she can, her body. Speaking of the events at the wedding, she says to Jason, you had so many words for the elders and yet none for me, a sign of her frustration at being treated as a non-entity. Her strategy, reminiscent of Aristophanes' Lysistrata, is to withhold sex, telling Jason that he cannot have her until Medea has left. The princess takes the control further as she is seen from the other side of the curtain getting undressed and teasing her new husband with the sight of her naked silhouette. It is interesting that this is not the only sexually charged scene in the film. In another scene, Medea also takes charge, attempting to seduce Jason. Both scenes show a deliberate choice to have these women take the back in some control in situations where they have very little. As the Glauke scene progresses, Jason clutches at his new bride through an almost translucent curtain, grabbing at her in an attempt to seduce her. Her serving women cover her with a sheet and giggle at Jason's advances. The heightened sexual tension is an interesting dynamic and gives two separate dimensions to the scene. Firstly, it explicitly shows the audience that Jason's attracted to this very young princess. This is important when we consider some of the aspects of the Medea story, where Jason remarks that this was a marriage of convenience, not of lust. Here, however, his animalistic behavior towards his new bride leaves no doubt at all about some of the intentions towards her. Secondly, and most poignantly, is Glauke's intentions in creating this tension between them to ensure Jason compels Medea to leave. This characteristic associated with the princess character is not seen elsewhere and is a show of strength and, and more importantly, one of personal agency. Glauke utilizes her body to entice Jason, exploiting his ar aroused state to manipulate him. Von Trier's Glauke creates her own agency. She does not accept the fate of being a young bride at the mercy of her older husband. 
Instead, she sets the ground rules, using her power as a woman to put Jason firmly in his place. <clears throat> Full French Full length features are not the only on-screen format that we find receptions of Greek tragedy. And in 2015, the BBC commissioned a TV series written by Mike Bartlett called Dr. Foster. It follows the protagonist, Gemma Foster, a GP, who discovers her husband, whom she shares a 14 year old son called Tom, has been having an affair with 23 year old Kate, her husband being called Simon. It proved popular, attracting nine to 10 million viewers per episode, and a second series was commissioned in 2017. The series is loosely based on Euripides' Medea, and Bartlett was no stranger to the play, having written and directed a version for the stage in 2012. However, unlike the play, in this televised version, he did not feel the need to remain close to Euripides, telling me, I was aware of setting the world up with the similar cast of characters, but beyond that, I let the story take its own path. With that in mind, Ben, it is an interesting example of reception to explore, and particularly in terms of its minor characters, like the other woman. Unlike the fifth century play, Kate is not killed. Actually, nor is Gemma and Simon's son, who represents the children in Euripides. This is a fairly significant adaptation to the fifth century play, and it therefore begs the question of her role within the series and what happens to her character. Mike Bartlett remarked, I'm always interested in taking tropey like roles, like the beautiful, silent, younger other woman, luring the audience in with them and then turning them on their head. We are not actually aware of who the other woman is until right at the end of episode one. She eludes the protagonist who never guesses her identity, although she tries to find out, until it is revealed to her through finding images on Simon's phone. Thus, she starts off as an anonymous character, much like her counterpart in Euripides. However, the once hidden mistress does not stay that way for long. In episode two, Kate makes an appointment at Gemma's doctor's surgery, but Gemma switches so that she can see Kate herself. Remember, at this point, Gemma does know that Simon is having an affair with Kate. In the scene, Gemma asks her if she's having sex regularly, and she replies, not enough, he's married, but unhappy, it's sad actually. Her remarks are not only audacious, but could also be seen as a play for power. Within her relationship at the moment, it is clear that she probably has little to say in terms of when she can see Simon, for example. Perhaps this is her way of gaining back some of the control, telling his wife without really telling her. As we saw, this is comparable to the power play in Lars von Trier's Medea, where Glauchy insists on Medea's exile before she will consummate her marriage. The scene does, does take another significant divergence from Euripides at this point, as Gemma performs a pregnancy test and discovers that Kate is pregnant. This is interesting. Instead of killing her off, a pregnancy arguably brings her closer to the protagonist than in the fifth century play. This child would be her son's sibling after all, and this idea of bringing the two women on a more even keel is prevalent throughout the series. For instance, I often notice that in the Medea narratives, there is an unspoken association between the protagonist and the princess character, a likeness in characterization, personality, and often background. For instance, in Ovid's Herodes 12, where my thesis looks at how in describing herself and her background, Medea is also describing her love rival. This is perhaps more evident in series two of Dr. Foster, however. One characteristic that is noticed, sorry, this is more probably more perhaps more evident in series two. However, one characteristic that is noticeable is the comparability of the women's intellect and cunning, a known trope of Medea. Throughout Dr. Foster, Gemma is consistently conspiring and devising plans to catch Simon out. And we see this same type of cunning in, in Kate also. In episode three of series one, she falsely tells Simon that, he has, that she has had an abortion because he didn't leave his wife as he had promised. This initially leads to Simon ending things with Kate. However, by the end of episode four, they are once again back together. Although it looks as if she hasn't told Simon that she is still pregnant because in the series finale, after a showdown involving Gemma announcing their affair and her abortion to Kate's parents and Kate hitting Gemma, Gemma notices Kate holding her stomach. She says, you're still pregnant. You didn't drink wine at the table. 
she was testing you, she says to Simon, to see if you wanted her or the baby. And you passed, went back, well done. Kate's deceptive yet astute test for Simon has paid off and he chooses her and the baby. And at the end of the series, we see a heavily pregnant Kate telling Gemma that she and Simon are moving away for a fresh start. Ultimately, after a lot of drama, including Simon attacking Gemma and thinking she had killed Tom, Kate gets her man and Gemma signs the divorce papers. The ending to the series is very European in that although Simon begins his new life with Kate, he loses his family, his job and friends having been ousted for his behaviour. I'd like to briefly talk about series two. I don't have so much time to go into too much detail, um, but it does need saying that Kate's character becomes a different figure in the second season. The once younger other woman is now a wife and a mother to two-year-old Amelie. The character's growth and maturity are pivotal within the narrative, and it shows in the control and strength she finally has within her relationship. In essence, Simon's life with Kate is now predicated on him being a good husband and father, and the audience discover this when Kate finds out that Simon has cheated on her with his ex-wife. Their expensive new home, his new business, everything he now has, has been provided by Kate's dad in order to ensure that his daughter gets the life she deserves. But when Simon cheats, it's all taken away from him. Kate's dad says to him, it was made very clear to you from the beginning that all of this, this whole life is my daughter's and you get to live in it while she's happy. The moment she's not, it snaps back. Simon's behaviours, his actions, have led to this moment, to the moment when Kate seizes all control and takes back her life. You knew the deal, it was all there, she said. You just had to manage being normal for two years, making a go of it. It all could have been yours, the house, the business, everything you ever wanted. You just had to love me and your daughter and not mess it up for two years. Dad always said you would, and I told him he was wrong. You're never going to see Amelie again. We're all moving to France. In this series, as in the first, Simon loses everything. He once again loses his family and finds himself ousted because of his behaviour. Kate becomes more than the other woman, and in many ways she becomes the new Medea in series two, a symbol of power and female authority, as she realises that Simon cannot be trusted. She arguably shows a great, the greatest character journey from other women with little power in her relationship to a woman with strength who wields all the power. In this fairly brief overview, I'm afraid, of how the once unstaged, unspoken, non dramatis personae princess of Euripides Medea is received and reworked into later receptions, it becomes clear that she is a figure who has once one of the most flexible and adoptable roles. In later adaptations, she not only becomes a character in her own right, she becomes symbolic of how these writers and filmmakers adapt and manage this two and a half thousand year old story, giving it new meanings that fit their agendas and contemporary worlds they are producing in. She is a key example of why we should not only look at the minor tragic characters more closely, but why we should further this by taking note of them in their later reincarnations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgina. That was brilliant. That was really interesting. And I know now that we have some time for people to ask questions. Um, you do have the ability to unmute yourselves if you want to ask a question directly. Um, otherwise, you can pop your question into the chat box and I'd be happy to read it out for you. Um, no problem to Georgina. Um, I have a question coming in already, I think. I'm just going to have a look. Um, I was going to ask one, but oh, I can see there's a few coming in straight away. So I'll give way to our guests instead. <laughs> You've referred mostly to, this is from Derek, you've referred mostly to Euripides Medea as the focus of reception. But you also briefly mentioned similarities to the princess as she appears in the Heroides. Could you speak a little bit more about that if you have the time? Yeah, so uh, what I looked at in Ovid's Heroides, and I'm not sure many people have picked up on it, but the way that the, the letter is kind of formatted is it talks a little bit about Medea and her life being young and where she comes from 
and then she quickly mentions this new princess and her life and where she's come from and there's these really key parts which kind of connect to each other so I was a princess my dad was the king of all these of this land and the same thing can be seen when she talks about Crusoe too um, so it's kind of my understanding from the reading that actually I think Ovid is trying to make these connections between the two princesses, if you like, they are kind of one and the same. And overall, I think he's trying to show that, that there's not much variance in Jason's choice of women. Um, and I kind of, it's kind of backed up when you go back to um, Herodes 6 as well, which is um, Hypsipyle's letter to Jason. And the language in there is so similar also. So I think there is this kind of thing that Ovid is playing with saying that Jason is you know he's a bad guy that goes for these women these types of women every single time and yeah so it's it's a bit more detailed than that in my actual thesis I promise but that's kind of you know the the brief idea of it anyway yeah there, there's a stereotype there's a figure there that we're, we're seeing yeah. um and I love that I love that with tragedy you can see it with comedy as well you have these kind of stock characters coming into play and they they might take on different shapes in in different versions of different plays or different authors might shape them slightly differently but there is kind of the usual features that do appear for these, these kind of characters mm. um joanna's asking is there a nurse figure in the dr foster series um maybe a best friend or a go-between there are a few okay. i would say there's um there's a, a a friend she works with and then a friend who lives opposite there's also um another woman that she kind of gets help from in the dr foster series um, and she gets to go spy on Kate for her. Um, so the nurse characters kind of, it's a bit like they've expanded the nurse character into the chorus as well, because the chorus of Euripides Medea is, is a chorus of women. It's the Corinthian women. So I think he's kind of taken this idea of many women together and given her these kind of tools to Gemma in, in Dr. Foster as well. So there are definitely nurse type characters. That's really interesting to see like the chorus we think of the chorus usually as maybe one voice um, but as it, was, as it was staged obviously you have different characters there that are representing the chorus so to see it broken down that way by a modern adaptation is quite a, a novel way to approach it and probably makes it more digestible for a modern audience as well so I really like that approach. Um, what about the name I mean I, we've got a comment in here um, saying the meaning of Creusa is new is very enriching um, you mentioned the fact that this was a common kind of taboo in ancient Greece, not to name, well, in, particularly in Attica, I should say, not to name women specifically, um, respectable women at least. Mm. Um, could you comment a little bit more on that and how that impacts kind of your reading of Euripides as a result and how we're trying to get or how you're specifically trying to get to these figures? Yeah, that we don't have much on the page, but we do find so fascinating. I know myself when I'm reading oratory and we, we hear these women are mentioned, but we don't have their voices, but yet it opens the door to thinking about what, what were their lives like, whether in reality or whether it's part of myth and literature. Yeah, I can't say I've thought much about the real lives of these types of anonymous winning, women, but I think there's definitely some comparison to be made with the real lives of women and the women that are, you know, featured in these tragedies. Um, to start with, I, I, I didn't notice this anonymity being anything kind of to do with real life. Um, it kind of came to me all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, we don't, we don't name women, they don't name women, it's kind of, a, it's, it's a thing <laughs> in Athenian society. So I looked a bit more into it and found a couple of people that have written about, you know, the social lives of women in Athens, as much as we can know about the social lives of women in Athens. And it came, it became quite clear that, you know, this is, this is a woman that's not supposed to leave the house, for starters, compared to, say, Medea, who announces that she is leaving the house. Um, so that's why she can't appear on stage because the, you know, the palace is not shown on stage, for starters, so they don't need an actual character. Um, and that she's not named at all. So it kind of, for me, it kind of fitted this idea of what we think at the moment the social lives of women might have been like in Athens, particularly when I, I read Shaps and he was talking about in the courtrooms and how women were often just kind of described as being, you know, such and such as wife, such and such as sister. Um, it kind of, yeah, it struck a chord, I think. And I think there's definitely more work to do there. And it's definitely something somebody should work on anyway, I think. 
Absolutely. The, the fact that these are mentioned and we don't really we get to yeah. hear their side or we don't get to to hear their own voices come through, whichever the genre is. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that I myself am fascinated with as well. And we're, we're so curious about the, the things that are not spoken, the things no, that are not listed. Not <laughs> Um, commenting from Bill, I found it interesting that the alternative death in the movie was leaping from the wall. Lots of princesses die that way in order to save their city. So again, another kind of feature that we see and kind of being used and manipulated in different ways. Yeah, I haven't thought about that actually. Sorry, I don't know much about the princesses leaping from walls, but that's something I, I think I will need to look at. Yeah, I think of, um, you know, reputable women hang themselves, don't they? I think most often, particularly. In that's kind of usually, yeah, that's the, yeah. the kind of dramatic way. Um, and for men, then it's, it's normally poison, isn't it? Yeah. Um, or by the sword. Um, so yeah, straight away, I'm going to Demosthenes, of course. But um, you have that usual kind of male way to, you know, to commit suicide and then the feminine then hanging is mm. I suppose the most reputable way to to commit suicide if you're a respectable woman that way as well. I've never thought about princesses leaping from walls so we might have to look into that a bit more because I don't know much about that I'm afraid sorry. <laughs> Would anybody else like to ask a question? Um, please feel free to unmute yourselves or raise your hand um, I'm sure I'll, I'll see it come up in the notification if anybody else would like to um, pick Georgina's brain on this even further. Would you recommend, well, your bibliography is on screen there, would you recommend anything in particular for people to follow up um, with their reading on this if they've been... Um... Well, start, to start with, you need to watch, you know, watch these things. I think uh, a lot of people, you know, don't watch them because they're worried that they're not going to be true to the kind of mm -hmm. the original tragedies, but we need to watch them with an open mind and think about them without considering their closeness to the tragedies because that, that's not the point of them they're there to you know enlighten us about our own times or certain times if you like uh -huh. um and there's um, the connections between the tragedies and them it's really really interesting um after that um if you're interested in Pasolini um bet she's good and Bar and um Borgeson, um there is some amazing kind of books just in general on reception. So um, if, you're in, if you're interested in Medea in performance, then Medea in performance 15, oh yeah, 1500 to 2000, I've got it up there as well. And um, that's a brilliant book. And um, Greek Women on Film, that's another really good one if you're interested in the lives of women from these tragedies and how we've kind of reinterpreted them into the film. This is all, of course, until we're waiting for your PhD to come out and we're all going to be <laughs> yes. picking the pages, breaking the spine of that to, to know more. Um, Alexandra is asking, a lot of Greek stories are being turned into novels recently. Absolutely. There's a, a huge fashion for that. Has the princess popped up in any yet? Well, she does um, appear in Christopher Wolf's uh, Medea. Uh, actually, she's got quite a big role in Christopher Wolf's Medea. She's, um, it's, it's different. She has a relationship with Medea in that. So I, I highly recommend that as a novel. It's really good. Um, I can't think of anything else that's more recent mm -hmm. than that in novels. Um, it's a difficult one to do, I think, Medea, um, because of, you know, killing children. Yep. It's, not, um, it's, not, it's not the nicest. It's, uh, yeah, it's a hard one to take, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's why we don't see them on the page so often um as much it's, as it's hard to create that empathy with yeah. Medea that you want in a in a, a main character that you want to understand and it's, it's exactly. as much as Euripides is successful in creating some sort of pathos and understanding her situation yeah. we do kind of see it from a modern perspective you can't help yourself in thinking about the acts that she does as well yeah, exactly I think that it just... works better on stage because you can remove yourself from it a bit more I think stage isn't real I think yeah. film becomes more real when you kind of engross into it and you see aspects of your life in film because of the way they make it so I think that absolutely and whether or not it's actually staged whether you see the the death of the children or whether that's included visually either on the stage or in a screen seeing the death of the children themselves is, is quite powerful yeah. so whether that's removed or whether it's just implied um, as part of the staging production as well is, is there mm -hmm. Megan are there any examples of Iphigenia or Electra in movies that you've seen and how are they if so so Electra and Iphigenia, there is an Electra film by uh, Kakionis. I haven't seen it yet. It's on my list. <laughs> To-do list. <laughs> yeah, I've been re-watching, um, you know, these films <laughs> too many times over the past kind of six months. Um, another film for Iphigenia, um, which is based on uh, Iphigenia at... 
I can't remember which one it is, but uh, it's Killing of the Sacred Deer. Uh, it's, yes. It's a really new film um, and it's got Colin Farrell on, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's on my list as well. Okay. I'm working kind of systematically through different characters, basically. As your research is progressing. <laughs> I'm trying not to bombard myself because like when you do reception, you have to do all the scholarship around, you know, the original text. And then you have to move to all the scholarship around all of the like the new versions and the, and the adaptations. And there's a lot. <laughs> Peeling so, back the layers. Yeah, exactly. Got so to get to it focused on Glauke. I'm currently working on Messengers at the moment, um, but Iphigenia is definitely one that I want to look at, particularly looking at Killing of the Sacred Deer because I've heard it's a phenomenal film. So it's it's a future, it's a future talk for Belfast Summer School that we can look forward to as well. <laughs> um, Joan has mentioned that Pandora's Jar, Natalie Haynes does write about Medea, so um, if anybody's interested in that element, you can pick up there with Natalie Haynes's fabulous book. Um, another question from Derek, how do the various films handle the departure of Medea via the dragon chariot? Uh, none of them have her leaving via the dragon chariot. <laughs> um, Pasolini has her on the roof of her house, um, having set fire to her entire house. Um, and it kind of ends with the sun really bright in the background, obviously replicating that imagery. In, um, and it kind of just ends there. So mm -hmm. we don't really know what happens to her um she she might have an apotheosis or she might you know just die in the burning house um it's not sure and i think pasolini wanted to keep it that way you know mm -hmm. kind of ambiguous um lars von trier um is really a viking-esque film it's so nordic um and actually she goes off on a boat so um yeah there's and there's nothing like that in dr foster because it's 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 you know it's sat in a market town <laughs> Not too far from London. Um, having, having dragons swoop in would, would kind of ru ruin that kind of illusion that it set up for, for the yeah. realism and the suspense. Exactly. Instead, they have her kind of, um, they have her going to help someone because she's the doctor. So, you know, she's a scene, she's in the middle of the marketplace with her son having a coffee and then someone really needs her help and she goes off to help them. And then that kind of ends like that. It's like, you know, happy ending. Um, in series one, that is, series, series two is a bit different. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a series two actually is quite dramatic. It's Tom leaves her son, they, he runs off and it is quite depressing at the end actually. So yeah, so, so no chariots, I'm afraid, with dragons. <laughs> Much the okay. pity. That's it, yeah, loads of people are saying how interesting this is. Kirsten is saying, have you looked at the stage adaptions as well? Or is that some part, have you reached that part of your research or is it, it mostly the, the television so, and the, the cinematic that you've looked at so far? So it is something I've looked at in the past. Um, it's something that I have, you know, flitted in and out of, um, but film is kind of, you, is, is my primary focus and it will be for, for my whole thesis. Um, maybe sometime in the future I might, um, but I've looked at a few, but nothing to any great detail. I'm better at reading films. <laughs> so, so for me, I'm just gonna stick with TV and film for now. <laughs> So that, that would be the second book in the series That's that we're going to be looking forward to. We're, we're planning your career out as we go with these questions. Yeah. This is fantastic. And then, and then maybe radio after that. <laughs> radio adaptation. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Um, there have been some recently here in um, by Irish Radio. Um, I, I must send you the links as well, that there have been a couple of plays um, that have been done um, by the, the Greek um, playwright. So I must send you the link for those as, again, maybe the third book in the series that you're going to do. Yeah, and of course, um, in all the online plays as well, like, um, you know, the recent one from Kings, but also um, uh, War Productions, is that what it's called? I think they put them on all the time and they have really famous faces like Francis McDormand and things, and they're fantastic. I really hi I highly recommend anyone watching those. I guess I could write about those because technically it's on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> An appendix. <laughs> Yeah, Kirsten mentioned she's asking because in Medea in Los Angeles, Creon and Glauke are made uh, the same character. So that's an interesting take on that one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that might be across. Yeah, yeah, that might be something to to look at in the future. I need to make a note. <laughs> <laughs> Copy it down quick. Copy it down. Um, I'll take this opportunity just to ask: Is there any more questions that anybody wants to ask before I release Georgina from the grilling we're giving her here and? telling her what her future publications are going to look like <laughs> and what we want her to work on. Um, is there anything that anybody would like to ask? Otherwise, it's my pleasure once again, just to thank our speaker 
um, for coming here to close off our lecture series um, and on a high as well. We couldn't have asked for better to, to wrap up the 2021 programme. Um, it's been superb to have you here um, to have such a really interesting topic to finish up with, something that I'm sure everybody now will be looking into Googling either adaptions or going back to Dr. Foster and, and watching it with new eyes. I certainly will. And I think Joanne said the same as well. We're definitely going to be looking at that with, I watched it and never made the connection. So I, I definitely have to go back now and, yeah, and lots try, of to, try to put those threads together and see exactly what you're talking about there for myself. So without further ado, we'll let Georgina off the hook then. And we thank her once again. I'm sure that the virtual claps will come through. Yeah, they're, they're going already. Um, so thank you, Georgina, once more. And we're wishing you all the best of luck with your future research. We can't wait to, to read about it. That's what we're hoping to see on a bibliography soon in the future as well. So best of luck with your studies. And thank you so much on behalf of Helen, myself, and the fellow tutors at the Belfast Summer School this year. We're really grateful that you came along today and ended our series for us. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. I've had fun. I was a bit Thanks. nervous, but I've had fun. Not <laughs> nervous at all. Future scholar to watch, a star in the making. So we can say we, we've had you first. Um, so thank you to everyone for attending once again. Thank you for those of you who are guests, who are past students who are coming back. Thank you to the current students who not only have had two classes this morning, but might, are in their second week of studies. Um, so thank you all for sticking it through. We have one more day of classes left but this is our final workshop or guest lecture for this series. So we're delighted. I know the students are exhausted. The tutors are definitely exhausted. So thank you all so much for sticking around and participating all week with us. And thank you absolutely to Georgina once more. Thank you everyone and see you soon.